so welcome to the to the big data public lecture series uh, to the 2016 edition um, our speaker today is uh, is Partha Talukdar Partha is an assistant professor in uh, the uh, CDS the Department of Computation and Data Sciences he's also an associate faculty in uh, CSA computer science and automation um, so Partha uh, got a PhD um, from UPenn um, and then for did a postdoc in uh, machine learning at, at CMU um, so his interests are in machine learning, in cognitive neuroscience, and uh, uh, also um, NLP, right, so natural language processing. Um, so he has worked for a long time in this uh, uh, NEL project, the never-ending language learner. So, uh, so ho hopefully we'll uh, hear a little bit about that from him today. Uh, so uh, in a short period of time, his work has been uh, kind of recognized uh, uh, widely, so he's a two-time recipient of uh, the Google uh, Focus Research Award, and more recently he also received the um, uh, uh, Open Innovation Award from Accenture. So um, with that, I would like to uh, welcome Partha to give his talk. Thank you. Hear me, right? Yeah. So thanks, uh, Vijay, for this very generous introduction, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, so as the title says, and this is since this is a big data lecture series, so I've tried to maximize the use of word big in my title here. Okay. So, uh, so I'll be talking about how we can go from large, unstructured text data to, uh, uh, to like large knowledge bases and why that's important. I'll try to keep the talk a little bit high level. Uh, but if you're interested in details of specific techniques, uh, then I'm, of course, very happy to explain those as well. So uh, I run the machine and language learning lab here, or in short, MOL. So the joke is that that's the happiest lab on in IAC, right? And that's what we try to do. OK, so, uh, so the thesis behind our work is that uh, background knowledge is really key to intelligent decision making. So uh, we as humans uh, make multiple intelligent decisions even throughout the course of our day, right? So even if I have this uh, water bottle here, how much force I sh should apply to lift this thing, right? You know, I already have some preconceived model and I use that much force to apply this, right? And this kind of uh, common sense knowledge or world knowledge I have accumulated over my entire lifespan uh, starting from uh, birth, right? And that hopefully continues uh, till death. Uh, so, uh, and that's really key to kind of like, you know, making, uh, having like a smooth transition or making these uh, decisions effective, right? And increasingly, we are asking also machines to take these kind of higher level intelligent decisions on our behalf, right? You know, like say, which next stock to invest next or which article I should read next and all of that. But uh, traditionally, machines don't have access to this type of background world knowledge that uh, you and I have acquired that we have access to, and it's really critical to uh, make these uh, decisions effectively, right? So, uh, so our goal is that to make these decisions more effective, we need access to this kind of broad coverage world knowledge, and uh, the question is how do we make such broad coverage world knowledge available to machines uh, at the right granularity, right relevance, and right point of time? So just to drive home the point, let's take a concrete example. Say if you have a sentence, like you know, say I have a natural language understanding system, which is say going over the web and trying to kind of like understand some document for me, right? And it comes across this particular sentence as Dickens with, with help is Sidney Carton's last words, right? Now for a computer to make sense of what this particular sentence means, it's a really challenging job, right? Even after kind of like say first uh, when you look at it, like, you know, maybe what kind of entities are present here, right? You know, Dickens, maybe, like, after some processing, it figured out that there are two entities, like Dickens and Sidney Carton, right? But the, what kind of relationship exists between them, right? So Sydney is also kind of like a city name, right? So is it really a city or a person? It's not clear. And also what relationships exist. But if you have, the, if you have read the right novel, Right? then it should be pretty clear to you what kind of relationship exists between them. Right? So maybe you have heard of Charles Dickens. Right? So maybe the Charles Dickens name, last name is used here. 
So in particular, if we kind of have access to this type of a background world knowledge where, say, Charles Dickens is an author who wrote the novel A Tale of Two Cities. A two, Tale of Two Cities has this character, Sidney Carton, which is mentioned in this particular sentence. Right? So similarly, uh, Charles Dickens is also mentioned by his last name in this particular sentence. Right? So if I have access to this structured knowledge, which is represented as a multi-relational graph in this particular case, then my understanding of this sentence is much, much deeper. Right? So now I can very easily say, it will be very natural for us to say that Sidney Carton is a character, and Dickens invented this particular character. Right? So if you didn't have this background knowledge, then understanding or inferring this relationship will be a really hard problem. Right? Definitely for us, for humans, but definitely hard for computers. Right? So, so that's kind of like the motivation here. Right? So, uh, the uh, you know, if you have the thesis is that if you have this kind of large uh, knowledge graph, uh, which encodes our world knowledge, common sense knowledge, then uh, the performance of these intelligent decision making systems will uh, will improve significantly. Right? Now, if you are with me in terms of this motivation. Then the question will come: How do we get this type of large unstructured, large uh, knowledge graphs, right? And uh, people in the past have also felt this type of a need for uh, knowledge, uh, large knowledge bases for artificial intelligence. But many of those efforts were very human labor intensive, right? So people would sit down and type some of this knowledge, which unfortunately doesn't scale, right? Because new data is becoming available. And new knowledge is uh, constantly be, being generated. So our goal is how we can automate this process and build this kind of large knowledge graphs from unstructured textual data. Right? So we see this unstructured textual data as a uh, source from which uh, we would like to extract this kind of knowledge. Right? So uh, we don't have to tell you that uh, like, you know, with the growth of the internet, there is an explosion uh, of uh, the amount of this type of data that's available on the World Wide Web. Uh, so in the form of websites, blogs, tweets, and all of that. Uh, so just to give you some concrete statistics, uh, in, according to some metric, in 2011 itself, 300 million new websites were added to the World Wide Web. Uh, according to Twitter, uh, just in one single day, half billion new tweets were posted. This is also a little bit old statistics from uh, to October to 2012. Probably this is even higher here, Jim. I was just curious about your previous slide that said the goal of decision making. Yeah. What kind of decision was premeditated by the person who was looking at the center and saying that is this the decision that they wanted that Dickens had invented this character, or were they looking for something else? Right. So the goal will be to kind of like say understand this particular sentence in a uh, deeper fashion, right? And one particular instance of that could be what kind of relationship exists between these two entities, right? So uh, the hope is that, like, say, if you have annotations of this form, then you can ask a, uh, uh, a system, like, you know, say, what kind of characters, uh, what kind of relationships, like, Dickens held with respect to his invented characters, right? So, like, you know, if you are, like, asking Google that type of a question, it will be hard to answer that right now. But if you have this kind of understanding, then, like, you know, that might be more feasible. Oh, by the way, just stop me at any point if you have any questions. I'll much rather prefer it to be a conversation rather than one way. Okay, so, uh, and also this is, uh, you know, I don't have to say, like, there's tremendous amounts of data. Uh, if you sit down and try to read it, it's going to take, like, years and years to go through even one single day's week, right? So we all agree that all of this data is probably not worthy, right, uh, for general purpose use, but there is lots of uh, knowledge, the human knowledge that's getting encoded in these documents and these tweets and sources, which computers currently are not very good at tapping into. Right? So that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to start from all these large unstructured data textual sources, which are written in natural language, and output some sort of structured knowledge graph of the form that we had seen before. Right? And when we are talking about this structured knowledge graph, for uh, purpose of this talk, it will be multi-relational graphs, where the nodes are entities of interest and the edges uh, which are typed will represent relationships that exist among those entities. Right? So, for example, IISC is located in, say, Bangalore, right? where IISC and Bangalore will be two nodes and is located in this relationship. Okay? So, uh, just to be uh, clear, 
So let's say out of those millions of documents, let's say we have two documents here. One says Luke Evans Hall is the current mayor of Pittsburgh, and the other document says after the death of then mayor Bob O'Connor, Luke Evans Hall became the mayor in September 2006, right? So when I'm talking about this knowledge harvesting from these text data sets, uh, uh, anyone reading these two documents will probably quickly infer that you know, two persons are being talked about here. One is Luke Revens Hall, the other is Bob O'Connor. There is a location, Pittsburgh, which is being mentioned here. There is a mayor of relationship between these two entities. And that's not it. There is also some amount of temporal information here, right? Because they were, not, not, they were both not mayors at the same point of time. First, uh, Bob O'Connor was mayor of Pittsburgh until his death in September 2006, and then Luke Revenstall took over. Right? So whenever I'm talking about these knowledge harvesting problems, I'm interested in detecting what kind of objects or entities are being mentioned in these documents, what type of relationships exist among them, and also these relationships or beliefs or facts are not universal. Right? So they have certain lifespans. They, uh, they are true from certain period to certain period, right? So how do we do that type of temporal scoping also automatically? For example, like uh, Manmohan Singh was prime minister of India, but he was not, he's not prime minister now, right? So they, he was prime minister for certain periods of time. Okay, so uh, by the way, the, you, all these like knowledge graphs uh, and their uses are not abstract concepts anymore, right? So in fact, for about two, three years now, Whenever you search on Google, you probably have seen this kind of uh, uh, structured uh, information on the right hand side, right? Has everyone seen, right? Uh, so this is called the knowledge panel, right? And this knowledge panel has been facilitated by uh, availability of this type of knowledge graph that we have seen before, right? Now this is really helpful because say if you search for who a current uh, president of US, you see Barack Obama and lots of useful information about Barack Obama very nicely structured, right? So in order to get this same in amount of information like his height, his siblings, like his uh, children's spouse and all of that, maybe you have to read two, three documents otherwise, right? But now this improves your web search experience and is helpful, right? So this is one concrete example where these knowledge graphs are already being used uh, in, in large scale applications. But uh, this is not a solved problem, right? So if you actually go and search, or at least when I did last, uh, for say Kum Mela, it's not as fortunate as Barack Obama, right? Now this is a really a big event, right? So it's the biggest congregation of people on earth. There are lots of things happen, right? So how many, I would like to know how many people uh, kind of uh, assembled in the last Kum Mela, when is the next one going to be, where is it going to be, all of that, right? But none of that information is available here. So according to Google's ex-CEO, uh, so they are still at 1% of where they need to be in terms of this knowledge graph. So which is at least two things. So one is that even with Google's all their financial and uh, technical powers, if they are still at 1%, then probably this is like a really hard problem, right? But the other optimistic part of it is that there is still this 99% headroom for improvement where we can make some contribution. Okay, so that's the motivation. Now this uh, never-ending language learning project uh, that uh, Vijay also mentioned uh, in his introduction is an attempt to uh, bridge this gap and uh, extract this kind of uh, knowledge uh, from unstructured, large unstructured text data or big text data. Right? So the project actually had two goals. Uh, so one is to advance a new paradigm for machine learning. So you might ask, machine learning have been very successful, right? So we see their applications all throughout. Why do we need a new paradigm for machine learning? So one is that the, yeah, the way the machine learning uh, algorithms are trained and used nowadays, that tends to be used in a very insular and restricted environment. So what we have is we are interested in building a particular type of a classifier or a regressor. We have some amount of training data. So we do some sort of function approximation on the data, and from that point onwards, we apply that on testing, right? So periodically, maybe if we have newer amounts of training data, we'll use it to retrain that particular model, right? But you and I, who are expert learners, we don't learn in that type of environment, right? So first of all, we don't have specific, well-defined training periods where we only learn during that period of time, 
and never outside of that, right? So our learning is continuous. As I said, it continues from birth till death, right? Also, we don't learn in that kind of a isolated environment, right? So we learn many different types of things over our lifespan and see how what we have learned in the past or what other things we are learning can influence whatever new task I'm trying to learn, right? For example, if I'm trying to say, uh, if I'm trying to learn how to drive a car, the fact that I can read signboards on the side of the road, that's a very valuable skill, right? And uh, I didn't start learning how to read those signboards on the side just when I'm trying to uh, learn the, to drive the car, right? Because I went through the entire school system, how to read, write, and all of that, and that's really coming in handy now, right? So the goal in the NEL project here is to kind of do machine learning in that type of a richer environment, in the environment like you and I uh, learn and try. So the idea here is to build a persistent software individual, which is to say that it's kind of like this never-ending part of it, right? So it's, it has an extended time horizon over which it learns, and hopefully a never-ending, uh, on a never-ending basis. Also learn, instead of learning one or two things in isolation, learn many different types of functions, many different knowledge, and exploit what kind of dependencies might exist among them, right? And benefit from that. Also, uh, learn easier things first and then more difficult things, right? So this is a, there's a technical term for it called curriculum learning, right? So whenever we are trying to learn something, we tend to learn the easy things first, then build on our competencies and learn more complex stuff later on, right? For example, if a baby is trying to learn a new language, he or she doesn't read the New York Times on day one, right? So first maybe kind of like uh, the characters, then words, phrases, sentences, kind of like builds on from there, right? So easy first and then more difficult. And then also as you learn more, uh, it should also become a more mature learner, right? So uh, its capabilities should improve over time. And also learn from limited amounts of experience or advice, right? So for example, like say, this is a, can draw a parallel to access to teachers who can correct our mistakes or give us feedback, but a teacher has limited amount of available time, right, that they can give us, right? So the amount of supervision that these learners can exploit is really limited, right? But so whatever the uh, limited amounts of access they have, uh, they have to make best use of that. So given this kind of like guiding principles, uh, so that was the part about uh, kind of like developing machine learning algorithms which are richer among those different uh, dimensions. And the NEL system itself is one instantiation of that framework, which is trying to extract and organize the knowledge as we have been uh, seeing before. So uh, what does the NEL system have as, has as input? It has an initial access to ontology. So ontology you can think of as like a bunch of predicates, which are say categories and relations, right? So say person, university, city, those are categories, right? And relations could be a uh, person lives in city, or uh, university is located in city, or mayor of, all those are relations. Right? So unary and binary basically predicates. It also has access to a few seed examples of each one of these predicates, right? So this is kind of like the limited amount of supervision or access time to uh, teachers, kind of an analogy. Right? So maybe like five examples of persons, five examples of cities, and five examples of mayor of relationships, right? And those individual instances. It has access to the web. So the project has some uh, additional quota uh, uh, from Google, so it can issue like 100,000 or 200,000 queries per day, right? But it also has an access to uh, a snapshot of about half billion uh, documents, which is locally indexed. Right? So it can issue queries against that as well, in addition to querying the web. And it has also occasional interaction with human trainers who can give, say, up and thumbs up and thumbs down kind of limited amounts of feedback. So given this input, the idea is to uh, run on a never-ending 24-7 basis. So that's the forever part. And on each day, we'd like to extract more facts from the web. So where facts will be these kind of, like, say, triples, right? So the IIS is located in Bangalore. And uh, also, as time goes, we at least don't want to degrade in performance, right? So uh, we'd like to uh, hopefully improve as time progresses, right? So this is the input, and this is the output, and that's kind of like the system specification. So given this, where does NEL stand today? So it has been actually learning continuously uh, for more than six years now, uh, since January 12, 2010. Okay? 
uh, on uh, January 12, we actually celebrate Nell's birthday with either t-shirts or uh, cakes. So if you are uh, around uh, our lab, so definitely you're welcome to join in for the next birthday. So uh, also by reading these documents, it has accumulated more than 90 million candidate beliefs. So these are the triples, as we were talking about, kind of like the edges in that graph. And it's growing daily. So in addition to extracting all these beliefs or facts, it also has the capability to do reasoning over that extracted beliefs, right? So for example, if, say, if I tell you that uh, Sachin Tendulkar, or so now maybe I'll replace that with Virat Kohli, right? So Virat Kohli plays for Team India, and uh, Team India plays sport cricket, right? So if I give you these two pieces of information, uh, then it will be very easy for you to infer that Virat Kohli probably plays cricket, right? So now you don't have to go and read that particular belief or fact in the text data, right? So given the, on the extracted beliefs, you can do this kind of reasoning, right? So Nell has certain capabilities to do that type of reasoning on top of extracted beliefs or extracted knowledge graph. So that's really helpful because now you don't have to go and read everything, right? So even on extracted stuff, you can fill in missing pieces of information. Yes? Is that just propositional reasoning or can it do all manner of uh, and all manner? Right now it's propositional, right? In, yeah, even, even like first order uh, rules, yeah. Including quantification for all? Uh, no, not at that level, yes. So it's kind of like more specific, like uh, instantiated beliefs. So uh, you can think of it as maybe like a link prediction over a graph, uh, where it uses the subgraph features to fill in missing pieces. Yeah. It can predict long links also, right? Then it can predict long links. Later on, it can predict. Definitely, yes. So each one of these beliefs also have an associated confidence measure uh, with it. But it can, of course, be also confidently wrong. But, uh, but it doesn't commit to any of the beliefs, right? So in each particular, because the system runs in iterations, in every iteration, every belief have to fight for its existence, right? So now say if you learn something wrong, and in the next iteration, there is kind of like accumulating evidence against it, so it can throw out that piece of it. Also, uh, it has the uh, capability to extend its own ontology, right? So I think that's really important for a never-ending learner because whatever we are specifying, maybe that's kind of like too limiting, right? So it will get bored over time. So what it can do is it can also extend or discover new predicates as it, as it sees is present in the data. For example, at one point it learned a lot about rivers, right? So what I mean by that is it knew a lots of instances of rivers and also in what kind of context people tend to uh, uh, mention river names, right, in, in natural language data. Uh, so things like it you know, you know, sat on the banks of blank, right, some river. So it also knew a lot about cities, right? Similar, similar instances of cities and what kind of context people tend to mention city names, right? Now by looking at these instances and how they are co-mentioned in text, it kind of like saw that like, you know, more than uh, random chance, people tend to co-mention instances of these two categories much more frequently, right? So now by combining these two things, it came up with this new predicate called river flows through city, right? Now that becomes a completely new learning task for the system, right? So that's a new relation. So now it has to kind of like maybe it can seed itself with a few instances of that particular relation. And now the goal will be to populate and find additional instances and put them all together in that big giant graph, right? So that's what I mean by automatically extending its ontology, right? So it's kind of, kind of can extend its ontology to fit the data that it's trying to model. Uh, so I'm of course representing work by uh, larger people. So here is a, a fragment of the NEL knowledge graph, which is automatically extracted by reading all these documents, right? Uh, so here the nodes are the entities uh, where uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, they play hockey. It's a hockey team. Uh, they, their hometown is Toronto, and they won the Stanley Cup, right? So that's how we can read these different. I think like the errors have been carefully removed from this particular graph, right? But just understand that there are errors. Uh, and the system is about 80 to 85 percent correct. So we do some random sampling of it, right? So that's what it is. And uh, in fact, the whole knowledge graph, in every five iterations or so, there is a dump that's made available. So you can go and download that from that this particular URL, right? Also, lots of metadata that's being used 
to do all these extractions, all of it you can download. Right. So some of them are easy to specify, right? So if your relation is functional, right? So maybe like you know a person can have uh, you know exactly one biological mother, right? So if that's your relation, so that you can easily specify whenever you are feeding that relation into the system, right? So we try to kind of like keep it like practical. Whatever things you can easily specify using one bit, right? Go ahead and do that, right? But if it requires lots of supervision over extended periods of time, we'd like to automate that. But in general, of course, not everything is as clear-cut as that, right? So cardinality estimations of relations is also a very interesting problem. But uh, right now, that's not part of it. Yeah. If you look at the learning and reasoning models of systems like Watson and so on, yeah. are they very different from the learning type? So the, uh, Watson is kind of like very uh, focused on question answering, right? So uh, they do make use of some amount of structured knowledge graphs. Uh, but their focus is on kind of like even like in runtime, I'll do analysis of these text data sets and find uh, just for that particular question whatever best I could do, right? In contrast, what we are trying to do here is kind of like build a background knowledge graph which might be useful for many, many different applications. That's right. So it could go either way because in that particular question, you also know what you are looking for, right? So you can kind of like prune down lots of things that you don't have to look into. But in our case, kind of like we are trying to be prepared for all types of situations. But uh, in our lab also, we are trying to kind of like do more focused work. Uh, so like if you have a particular domain, how do you build a knowledge graph for that particular domain? In fact, we have a new uh, collaboration starting with uh, IBM where we are trying to, IBM Research Lab here, uh, where we would like to build a knowledge graph, but for a particular task. Any other question? Yes. Right, right. So actually, if you go to the website, uh, along with each fact, there is also a thumbs up and thumbs down uh, link, so which you can go and give that type of feedback, right? Uh, and then apart from that, there is the initial supervision that I mentioned, the seed examples that forms like a bulk of the supervision that goes into the system. And then the other is, which is like a untapped uh, resource for supervision, is that Nell also has a Twitter handle, right? And uh, when I last checked, there are a few thousand followers, right, of this Twitter handle, where Nell also posts interesting facts as it sees interesting, right? And fr from time to time, that's politically incorrect as well. And people are very happy to give feedback, right? So they will kind of like say, hey, like, you know, Nell, uh, this is like a very bad mistake. Uh, you know, you should uh, like use stupid AI bot and things like that. But they're also sometimes they're very kind and kind of like say, hey, that was really good. And uh, what the fact that you posted and like, you know, here is kind of like an explanation why that's good and all of that, right? So uh, it's, I think, really interesting that like, you know, all these people are following a, an, uh, an AI agent and having some conversation. So one open question there is how do you model that conversation to kind of like better harness the, uh, the feedback that's coming? So does the feedback No, right now it doesn't use, right? That, that, so that's why I said it's kind of like an open problem. Because if it were kind of like more binary feedback, uh, the thumbs up and thumbs down it makes use of, right? But understanding those tweets and those things is uh, like some more work is there. Okay, so of course not all problems are solved. So one severe problem is this problem of sparsity in the knowledge graph. So in this particular case, I would like to infer probably that, or like you know, have an edge already saying that Toronto Maple Leafs is actually in country Canada, right? And then the other is like the temporal scoping problem, right? So Toronto Maple Leafs won't Stanley Cup, but they are not like the perpetual winners of it, right? So they won in particular year, but probably they are not the current champion. So when did that particular fact happen? So, uh, so those are kind of like some of uh, the missing issues, and I'll touch somewhat on those uh, aspects. Uh, but to just put this uh, project in context, 
Uh, as I mentioned, there have been other efforts in the past where people have tried to this uh, harness knowledge uh, in various forms. So PsyCorp was, Psy was one of the earlier efforts where they went for a really uh, human intensive effort where people would be recruited to type down all these types of knowledge. Right? As I said, that's not really very scalable. Uh, Freebase is another effort uh, which uh, again is user contributed and was later acquired by Google, right? So which is also user uh, uh, contributed uh, and uh, now they are growing it internally. Uh, and those knowledge panels that I mentioned earlier is making use of uh, Freebase and the expanded version internally at Google. Uh, the Yago project, which was actually used by IBM Watson uh, as well, uh, is uh, looking at semi-structured data. So these are user contributed, humans are typing. Uh, the Yago is looking at semi-structured information like the uh, Wikipedia info boxes that you see on the right hand side, right? So there's some amount of organization of the knowledge has already happened. It's trying to kind of like or, you know, better uh, aggregate that information. So Google Knowledge Vault, uh, which was kind of like a project inspired by uh, Nell and the Nell itself, is kind of like trying to do the most ambitious thing in this spectrum of going purely from unstructured data to type of structured knowledge graph that we have been talking about. Right? Other things are either user contributed or starting from semi-structured uh, knowledge. Already. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more, we had a, a AAAI paper last year, which is kind of like uh, where we documented uh, lessons learned and uh, uh, some of the system internals and things like that. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Um, so there is kind of like a whole uh, work on like description logic and like knowledge representation. Lots and lots of work has happened there. Uh, so in many cases, graphs, I mean, we, we are probably kind of like most familiar with, I mean, there are definitely other alternatives uh, to graphs, but graphs are tend to be kind of like very general, right? Uh, at least for the basic things it can handle, the, it has enough representation power. And we also like, you know, machine learning and uh, we know like, lots of graph algorithms which would be useful for doing the inference and things like that, which we don't have to reinvent for like a, a newer, uh, newer set of presentation language. So it's kind of like combination of convenience and like, you know, what you know about things. Okay, so uh, here is uh, some results uh, from the paper where on the x-axis you see iterations, uh, which is a proxy for time. Nell is close to, I think, or just across 1,000 iterations in this six, more than six years uh, time frame. And y-axis is the size of the knowledge graph. Right? So as you can see that over time, uh, the size has increased, right? So which is kind of like a healthy sign. And you see that this is not always a uniform increase, right? So sometimes, uh, like, you know, you get very steep jumps uh, in uh, knowledge uh, size. And like, sometimes it could even come down because as I said, it can also unlearn some of the facts that it has learned, right? It's not just unidirectional. Now, uh, so which is uh, interesting, but uh, of course, like we also have to think about quality, right? So just growing the knowledge graph, I can just throw maybe lots of noise. Yes. What, what is the inferences of this research? Is the sum of it is information is getting from actual documents and the rest of it is inferred, right? Right. What part is inferred and what part is extracted? Uh, so I don't have that uh, 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 exact split, but many times what happens is uh, it need not also happen as like separate things. So what happens internally is there are like multiple subsystems, right? Even for one particular say learning task, different algorithms are at play, right? So for a single belief, it may, you may still extract from the text and you may still also infer from the knowledge graph. And in those cases, the confidence of the system in that particular belief increases. So because you would expect it to start widening, right? Because with fewer additional beliefs, you can interpret or infer a lot more as time goes along. Right. So you would expect that the extracted part to be doing much less than the inferred part. Right? That's right, that's right, right. And also like maybe like over time, the low hanging fruits in terms of extraction will dry out and then probably you will do more and more inference. But it'll be very, the, the, the information is there, we just, it'll be easier to calculate as well, but it'll be interesting. 
Okay, so uh, this is the growth, but uh, as I mentioned, there is no point in just uh, blindly increasing the size. But we also did some calculation on uh, the quality estimate. So we again see that, like over time, the performance has hovered between, say, like you know, around 80% mark, which is kind of promising, and oh, off late it has gone up a little. Uh, so that kind of like satisfies this requirement that, like you know, it should become a better learner over time and it also like it should extract more number of facts as time goes on. So it's very simple. Uh, here it's a quality estimate, right? So uh, here we do some sort of like sampling of uh, edges from the graph and then uh, using humans uh, evaluate whether those are correct or wrong. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Do you also measure how much uh, information has come from human intervention? From human intervention? Yeah, so uh, initially when the system was started, uh, even before this particular uh, uh, limit, I think there was kind of like a little bit of a big dip in terms of performance, right? So at that point of time, there were like uh, some more uh, seeds or some more feedbacks were provided, which helped it steer in the right direction. So apart from that point, there haven't been any large intervention from humans. Right? So it has been mostly self-supervised. Uh, uh, modulo those kind of like seed examples and the thumbs up, thumbs down kind of thing. So actually there are kind of like uh, systems in check here. Uh, so I'm not going into kind of like different enablers uh, behind the system. So if you look at those, there are some uh, kind of like this couple semi-supervised learning techniques. So uh, the, the fact that I was telling earlier, like you no, know, you don't want to learn a particular function in isolation learn all these different functions together and exploit what type of dependencies might exist, right? So even if you have a lightly supervised problem like this, because of this additional coupling constraint, that helps the system not go like in the wrong path, right? So it provides additional uh, supervision in terms of constraints and coupling. So that has been one of the enabling factors for the system as well. And maybe you kind of like why we haven't needed as much human intervention as otherwise we would have expected. Okay, so, um, so yeah, in terms of that knowledge, so uh, we'd like to kind of like make use of it in some applications, right? So for that, the knowledge has to be available first, and it also has to be fresh, right? Uh, so if you like, you know, if you're say querying, if a robot is navigating inside the house and it's using this as my knowledge source, if it's issuing queries and most of the time the system says, I don't know, I don't know, then that's not really helpful, right? So either the knowledge should be already available or inferable. And also, if the system uh, robot asks, right, you know, who is the current prime minister of India, it should not say Manmohan Singh or Atal Vyari Bajpayee, right? So the information and knowledge also has to be fresh. So I'll uh, quickly look at kind of like some of these inference and temporal scoping issues. Uh, so here is again the knowledge graph that we had seen before. And we'll look into a little bit about this kind of like inference that I was telling about, right? So if you look at it, if you focus on this right-hand part of the graph, uh, so GM competes with Toyota, and Toyota is an economic sector automobile, right? So if I club these two pieces of information, then it's really easy for me to probably say that GM is also in economic sector automobile, right? But uh, all these length two parts are not equally predictive, right? So if I, if I look at this other part, GM competes with Toyota, and Toyota created Prius. Now I can't infer that GM uh, created Prius. Right? So certain paths in this graph are predictive for existence of particular types of relations, and certain other graphs are not, certain other paths are not. Right? So the question is, how do you learn these kind of inference rules automatically from the data itself, so that like, you know, we don't have to again go and type all these rules ourselves, which again will not be scalable. Right? So that's the knowledge graph inference problem. Uh, so, so Ni Lao, in his thesis, who was also part of the uh, Nell project actually came up with a very clever idea. He said, like, I'll kind of like build a classifier which, given two nodes, will predict whether a particular relationship exists between those two entities or not, right? Because that's the inference part anyway, right? But as features, I will basically derive paths from the graph and let the model figure out during training whether certain paths are discriminative for a particular type of relation or not. Right? So, uh, so just to kind of like give you a concrete example. Let's say my query is uh, which country is Pittsburgh located in, right? And that's my entire knowledge graph for, for now, right, for this particular example. 
And these inverse relations, so these minus ones that you see, represent the inverse relations. Okay, so R A B is same as R inverse B A. Okay, so uh, and there are like different paths, as I mentioned. Those will be my features in my model, right? So now, if I follow say this particular path, so Pittsburgh city in state, Pittsburgh is in state Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has these two cities, Philadelphia and Harrisburg, right? Uh, that's in city and state, and city located in country. Philadelphia and Harrisburg is in country US, right? So if I follow this particular path, most often I end up with the right answer, right? Remember, I don't know that US is the answer right now, right? Because I'm trying to decide between US and Japan here, right? So this particular path looks really useful for making this inference of which country this particular uh, city resides in, uh, is located in. But again, all paths are not equally good, right? So if I look at this other path, which is a feature in my model, the Pittsburgh has offices of these two companies, PPG and Delta. Delta also has offices in Atlanta, Dallas, and Tokyo. Atlanta and Dallas have offices, are located in country US, right? But then Dallas takes you to this uh, wrong answer, Japan, right? So I followed the same path, but in this case, you know, two times I arrived at the right answer, and once I arrived at the wrong answer. Right? So as you can see, uh, that I can I can list down, or I can discover these different paths. Some of them will lead me to the right answer. Some of them will lead me to the wrong answer. Right? So this PRA algorithm, path ranking algorithm, basically discovers all these different paths, ranks, uh, determines how discriminative they are for my particular relationship of interest and then uses them to do the missing piece information or the knowledge graph inf inference problem. Right? So in fact, they, there are, so just for the city located in a country example, there are about like 2,985 paths, close to 3,000 paths that it discovered, and each one of them also have an associated uh, score of how discriminative it is for that particular relation. Right? Now the good thing here is, that as long as you have the knowledge graph and it's sufficiently dense, right, it's sufficiently connected, then you don't need additional supervision, right? You don't have to go and provide these rules yourself. If you have those things, that's great, but you don't have to list them manually, right? So it cuts down on the supervision and the system can kind of like take it up and learn all of these things automatically, right? So it's kind of like a self-supervised system and that's really helpful to overcome the sparsity problem. Now, one issue with this is that this PRA algorithm will work great when my knowledge graph is sufficiently connected, right? Because I have to discover all these connections, discover all these paths, right? But then, if you remember, we wanted to use this inference algorithm to fill in missing edges in my graph itself, right? So there's a chicken and egg problem here, right? So I wanted to, uh, this particular algorithm will work great when the graph is sufficiently connected, but then, I wanted to use this thing to improve or reduce the sparsity in my knowledge graph, right? So how, how do we kind of like overcome this particular issue? So what we did was basically, I, I won't go into the details of this, uh, but uh, what we did was instead of kind of like looking purely on the knowledge graph, we did some sort of like uh, local extractions of like say belief triples from natural language data itself, right? So we took about those half billion uh, web pages did some uh, syntactic parsing, like, you know, say, John kicked the ball, then you know that John is the subject of the verb kick, and uh, ball is the object of the verb kick, right? So we extracted all of this, so th those are called SVO triples. Uh, so it's kind of Bill Clinton was born in Hope, Obama was born in Honolulu, and things like that, right? So uh, we extracted about 600 million such triples from a corpus of 230 billion tokens, right? So which is about half billion documents. At that, at that point of time, I think this was one of the largest such data sets used for academic research work. So what we do is we basically take that KB, right? So this is kind of like a very sparse situation from a knowledge graph, right? So we'd like to discover some relationship between Alex Rodriguez and World Series, right? But this, the two nodes are actually disconnected, so they are not, like, you know, there's no hope of PRA doing anything here. Right? So what we do is basically we uh, link this knowledge graph with all those extractions that we got, those SVO triples, we create like a much larger graph and do inference over this joint graph. Right? Now, uh, if you remember, the features for my this PRA model were all these paths, right, which kind of like constituted, uh, these, uh, which were made out of these different relation names, right? 
So earlier, if I had few hundred relations, now because I have all these verb phrases as potential relation names, I have blown up the number of features that I have, right? Because those paths or features are combinatorial objects, right? So, uh, so that kind of like that's a severe uh, sparsity feature sparsity problem, right? Uh, which is not good for learning. So we did some latent factorization of these verb phrases and uh, use some latent factors to improve performance. So in the interest of time, I won't go into those details, but you can think of this as like learning some representations, then doing some clustering over that data, and then using those clustered labels in sense of, instead of those surface labels as the labels, as the edge labels, and then doing inference uh, uh, like we had done before. And we also find that these kind of clusterings uh, through these factorizations are not very crazy. For example, like, you know, lies on or runs through or flows through all happen to belong to the same cluster. So it kind of like gives you some idea that uh, something useful is going on. And we also find that like in repeated experiments, the, uh, instead of doing uh, inference purely over the KB, if you use these kind of SGO data, if you do inference over that augmented graph, then the performance tends to improve significantly. Okay, so this is one attempt to overcome the sparsity in the knowledge graph through uh, doing additional inference over extracted knowledge. Uh, and uh, also in our lab here, uh, we have continued to follow this line of work uh, in kind of like how we can overcome knowledge graph sparsity. And we have a couple of uh, lines of explorations and published papers uh, along that dimension. The other thing is this uh, temporal scoping problem, right? So how do we kind of like keep the knowledge graph fresh? So uh, we had done some work uh, along this dimension, and we found that also there, uh, this coupling idea helps, right? So if instead of trying to decide, say, when uh, Bill Clinton was president, if you couple that with the fact that, uh, like, you know, if you're trying to decide at the same time, when was Al Gore vice president? And you know that Al Gore was Bill Clinton's uh, vice president. So you know that like, no, their tenures will have to be temporally contained or related to one another, right? So basically, even for the temporal scoping problem, if you use this kind of temporal constraints, then that's really helpful and that helps performance, right? But then the question there is, how do you learn those kind of common sense temporal constraints or tem common sense temporal knowledge that you and I take for granted? So we did some work along that dimension. And here is actually one snapshot of uh, temporal common sense knowledge that the system was able to pick up by mining large amounts of data. Right? So what it means here is each one of these boxes represent a relationship or an event in a, say, politician's life. So this is focused on a politician, right? So just to make, take a concrete example, unidirectional edges mean that the source event happens before the target uh, event, okay? From, uh, from the algorithm's perspective. And the bidirectional edges mean that both of these two events are uh, simultaneous, okay? And these numbers here uh, represent some sort of like unnormalized uh, confidence measures in that particular uh, common sense. So, so this is entirely automatically induced, okay? And what the system thinks is that all birch-related events tend to uh, be simultaneous, and hence this uh, bidirectional arrow. And the person or the politician needs to be born first before he can become leader or have influence over organizations. And all those things tend to happen before that person dies, uh, and all death-related events also tend to be uh, simultaneous, right? But this is not always like 100% true, because sometimes people, even after their death, tend to have influence, right? So, uh, like, say, maybe Ronald Reagan in US politics now, right? So anyway, so we have some techniques which also exploits large amounts of big text data to derive this kind of common sense temporal knowledge, knowledge in this particular case. So we again use these induced uh, constraints, fed it into our inference system, and we found that that also improved performance in the temporal scoping problem, right? Now, again, you might ask, like, you know, uh, you know this seems very common sense, obvious knowledge, so that's obvious to us, but not to machines. And again, we don't want to sit down and write all of those things ourselves because that will, again, not be scalable. Right? There is one demonstration that we can at least do some of that, automate some of that process. Uh, we have also done some work uh, recently uh, in uh, 
uh, estimating the quality of credibility of sources, right? Because all sources are not equally uh, equally valuable, right? Because and especially when you have these kind of like say uh, non-black and white facts, right? You know, if you want to ask like is a chicken healthy or not, you could kind of like have arguments both ways, right? So one question is how do we kind of automatically induce the credibility of different sources, right? Uh, and how we can use those to uh, derive basically you know, better uh, knowledge and better inference. So we have, uh, I think that's a really important problem and uh, we have some work uh, along that dimension as well. So, uh, so that's kind of like mostly about some uh, pieces of work from the large scale modeling of text and the knowledge that's contained inside them. But the bigger uh, idea here is, uh, so text is not alone, right? And if you think about it, most of these documents are not machine generated, right? So these are humans generated and which are a reflection of what's going on inside our head, right? So kind of like there is some mental representation and processing and that process is generating all these data, right? So that way I feel like text data is somewhat unique to many other modalities like say image and video because those are captured by machines, right? And they tend to be non-discriminative, right? But in case of text, if I have to describe this particular scene, I'm not going to talk about all nitty gritty details here, right? So I'll give you kind of like high level uh, descriptions that I think will be interesting to you, right? So, uh, so because it's generated by humans, it's kind of, uh, it's giving us one view of what's the mental representation and processing that's going on in our heads. But the other, over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, with the advances in brain imaging techniques, give us a peek inside that same mental phenomenon more directly, right? So if you think about it, uh, we think of these two as two different modalities, which are, repre which are representations of the same latent conceptual organization that's going on in our head, right? So the question is, instead of looking at these two modalities in isolation, if we can somehow combine them, right? So, uh, exploit both uh, text and brain imaging together, then maybe we can do a little bit better. So I and my colleagues have been uh, doing some uh, work in connecting text and uh, brain data together uh, and trying to make some uh, progress. So, so one uh, other advantage of this combination is that brain data is hard to collect, right? So for that you have to put people inside some scanners, there are lots of noise going on, people get tired very quickly, right? It's not a natural environment to be in, right? So you get a little bit amount of uh, brain data, and like we have lots and lots of text data, right? So it's maybe they're kind of like complementary, and maybe by combining these two things, uh, we can get some insight. So in fact, for a uh, story reading experiment, we were able to show that uh, while researchers previously uh, were able to decode which parts of the brain become activated, when people are reading stories, right? So story reading is a complex phenomenon because you have to like, you know, keep track of lots of things, uh, like, you know, create, uh, follow a completely different world that the author has uh, created for you, right? You have to keep track of all of that, right? So previously people were able to decode which parts of the brain become activated when we are doing story reading. But because of our uh, combination of text with these brain imaging signals, in addition to where, we are also able to address what gets encoded and processed in these different regions, right? So if you think that like here, we, are, we just have one color and the intensity is there, but here we are able to put different colors in different regions, right? So maybe like syntax is processing, getting processed here, semantic knowledge of this particular type is getting processed here. So uh, that also attracted uh, some amount of attention from the popular press. So this is one uh, instance of an example where, uh, which kind of like shows that if you combine these different modalities, maybe you can answer some additional questions compared to like, you know, looking at each one of these modalities in isolation. So I'm uh, also very happy of the, of the CNS department here, which is very timely, uh, like in a timely fashion that it got formed and instituted. And uh, with colleagues here also, we've been following some amount of work uh, along these dimensions. So uh, to wrap up, so this uh, phrase from strings to things was made popularized by Amit Singhal who used to run Google search uh, till end of February. 
So he came up with this phrase when they made this transition to knowledge graphs. Well, earlier, everything in Google search was pretty much keyword search driven, right? So you type in some keyword, they go and like match in some documents and try to give some ranking over that, right? But now the emphasis is the shift is towards understanding both your query and the documents at a much deeper level and try to pro satisfy your information need by understanding the data at that much deeper level, right? So and by deeper level, I mean like, you know, what kind of objects are there, what relationships are being mentioned, and all of that, right? So basically this whole knowledge graph transition, right? So, uh, so uh, as a community, we have some handle on how we can go from large text data uh, to some amount of uh, structured knowledge graph. Also, this is not a one-time process because new knowledge, new data is becoming created. So this is also a maintenance question, right? So how do you keep it fresh uh, when new data becomes available? Also, it need not be a uh, single modality, even though we have been primarily looking at text, images, videos, all those also may give you complementary information, right? Uh, also, just construction of these knowledge graphs is not the end goal, because we would like to make use of those uh, in uh, some uh, intelligent decision-making agents, right? So, you know, say robot navigating inside the house could use this as a knowledge source. And then also it need not be a one-way street. These applications could also dictate how this knowledge graph grows over time, right? Uh, so in our lab here, we are interested in this entire spectrum of construction, maintenance, and application of this knowledge uh, going all the way from unstructured data to end applications. Okay, and so here are some examples of uh, work uh, that's being spearheaded here, and some of those lab members are also present. Uh, questions like how do we evaluate these large knowledge graphs, right? So we have these millions of edges in this graph. How can we accurately do accuracy estimate? Like, you know, how good this particular current knowledge graph is and we as poor academics, we may have only 100 rupees to do that evaluation, right? And if you have to get human feedback, we have to pay people, right? So how do we make best use of that 100 rupees to get as close a true estimate of my current knowledge graph as possible? That's one question. How we can do read time, a temporal information from the text data itself? How we can do large scale learning and representation? how we can go expand the knowledge graph in a goal-directed fashion, right? So I have this general purpose knowledge graph. I have, say, uh, some uh, journal papers from bioinformatics, right? So how do I expand my knowledge graph so that I can understand those bioinformatics papers at a much deeper level? Right? So maybe I know about genes, but I may not know about proteins, right? So I have to increase my knowledge about proteins before I can go and read those documents. Also, uh, deep distance supervision is another topic uh, we are looking at. Uh, we have active collaborations with external partners, more primarily with the machine learning department and the NEL group at CMU and at a few other places. Uh, Google Research, right from the beginning, have been very uh, generously supporting our work, including uh, Accenture, Bosch. So as a final thought, uh, so all of you may have heard about the IBM Watson and Jen also mentioned about that. So I think, uh, which went on to beat humans in the game of Jeopardy. So I think, and if you have to believe all these other uh, analyses and this, uh, the name of this uh, lecture series, the big data, right? So I think we have a tremendous opportunity to go from this big text data to this big knowledge, right? And through that process, uh, overcome or fill this knowledge bottleneck issue, which has plagued AI systems all along. Right? This kind of like need for knowledge. And it feels like this is the right time to address this particular question because uh, of three things. One is because of the availability of data, availability of computation, and advances in machine and statistical learning techniques. Right? So if you think about it, nowhere in human history these three things came together. Right? And probably now is the first time where we, like, you know, we are seeing at least convergence of these three things. And uh, we are really excited to be working at that intersection. And our work spans uh, machine learning, natural language processing, and big data analysis. And together with all of this, uh, we want to have an impact on intelligent decision making. There are a lot more things to talk about, but uh, I'll stop here. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm also very happy. Like, you know, big data is very popular now, to the point that even my parents decided to join this particular talk. Right? 
So uh, with that, I'll stop here. Uh, and if you have any questions. But before I do that, I'll also show you a demo of a uh, recent contest that we participated in. Right? So this was uh, instituted by this uh, LNAI for artificial intelligence, uh, where the goal was to build a, an AI system uh, uh, which can answer eight grade science questions. Okay? So you have to read basically, first of all, you can read as much as you want in terms of uh, science textbooks and all of that. And uh, uh, in, during test time, you will be given a question, and you have to choose one of those four multiple choice answers, right? And then you can get uh, basically scores. So we, uh, we weren't like working on question answering systems before, but like somehow we uh, put together in about a month's time through lots of hard work of my lab uh, members. And uh, here is the system which we actually submitted, and we were about uh, ranked 10th out of 170 teams. Uh, worldwide. So we also fielded this during, uh, uh, during the last open day, uh, which is posed as like a human versus computer quiz challenge. Humans still beat in that open day, by the way. Right? So humans were 512, and this guy was uh, 490. So maybe we can try one or two questions and see what happens today. Right? So by the way, all of these questions the machine has never seen before. Okay? And again, uh, I should say that we did kind of like, like the basic things that could be done. There are lots and lots of things that could be done here. So even if it horribly fails, just don't give up your hope, right? So uh, because it's just a simple thing. So I'll just uh, get a new question. So what's human's answer? The question is, the result of fertilization is that blank of the genetic information comes from the mother. Sorry, half? All right, both computers and human got the right answer, right? And we also show on the right-hand side what are the system's confidence on these different choices, right? So here it seems it's quite confident on option D. Right? So we'll do just one more. So which of the following allows the planets to stay in orbit? Human? D? Sun's gravity? OK, all right. So it's a tie here. So maybe on that high note, we'll stop before the machine fails, right? <laughs> and uh, but if you have more questions, I'll be happy to take those. That's right, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's where we would like to go, right? Uh, because right now, we are kind of like still very much focused on the construction part itself. But uh, you know, uh, if you find a good application, then of course, like, uh, based on the information need of the user, or like whether human or agent, we would like to grow the knowledge graph along that particular dimension, right? So it could be something like you, know, you are repeatedly asking about proteins. And I'm saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But then maybe that might be a cue that I should go and read up about proteins so that like, you know, I can answer the next question better. Very good. Yeah. You told that when input is web but do you also restrict the access to only say, reliable sources, for example, Wikipedia? Because recently this Microsoft bot, it learned some bad things. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So what do you think? This is the yeah, so uh, that was kind of like one of the motivations behind doing the credibility estimation of sources, right? So maybe like uh, Wikipedia might be good for certain things, right? But it's not good for everything, right? So if I want like a deep technical concept, maybe I will have to like go and read the research papers rather than the Wikipedia article itself, right? Wikipedia will give you kind of like curated small amounts of knowledge, but the web is much, much bigger than that. And we would like to selectively make good use of that, of the rest of the data. Right? Yeah, so, so my question is, is yeah. right Uh, no. So it just, the system, the, you're probably talking about the NEL system, right? Yes. Yeah. So NEL only can't read about itself, right? So because otherwise it will be just like reinforcing itself. So the CMU NEL pages are not uh, used, and, uh, but it can just like access anything else. 
we are, I should also mention, by the way, we also have a local instantiation of the NEL system here uh, that we are trying to uh, kind of like build more domain specific versions of it. And this is probably like the only instance where the system has been installed outside of the CMU home environment. Thank you.